Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, my name is Nora Valenzuela. I'm the chair of the World Affairs Council of Orange County and have the honor of hosting Ambassador Butler today. Um, I'd like to welcome all of you, uh, those who are from Southern California and those who have joined us from other councils nationwide. Um, although COVID has brought challenges um, for us to have our in-person meetings, but it's also been great to provide uh, webinars so others from other councils can join us. Um, the individual who will be doing our moderation today, our moderator will be Mr. Uh, William Edwards. Um, Bill uh, is one of my teammates. I have the honor of having him as a member of our uh, board of uh, directors, but he is also the uh, vice chair of District Export Council of um, Southern California. Bill has about 46 years experience in operation development and entrepreneurial engagement. Uh, uh, basically internationally, um, has lived in seven different countries and um, done projects in over 50 countries. I think uh, Ambassador Butler has lived in more countries and speak a few more languages than both of us, but I think between the three of us, we probably covered most of the countries in the world. I too have lived in a number of different countries. Um, Bill um, is going to be moderating the event today. Uh, your questions can be submitted on chat and they will be sorted out by Bill and also presented to the ambassador. If you would kindly have your speakers off and then we will do a wrap up at the end. Again, welcome everyone. Uh, looking forward to having a wonderful informative um, event and it's an honor to have you ambassador. Welcome, sir. Uh, Bill, I turn it over to you, please. You're muted, Bill. Okay, all right, there we go. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Thank you very much for the introduction, Nora. Uh, we're very honored, the World Affairs Council of Orange County is very honored today to have with us uh, Ambassador Lawrence Butler, retired, although he says he's retired several times, but uh, retired from being the formerly an ambassador. Ambassador Butler spent 40 years with the US Foreign Service uh, and says usually as far away from Washington as he could get. I understand that. I spent a lot of years working in the US corporate world and always preferred to be somewhere other than the head corporate headquarters in the US. Uh, currently, he supports US military exercises uh, as the US ambassador as well as policy advisor to uh, U.S. Corps and Division Headquarters and U.S. Special Forces teams. While in Iraq in 2010 and 11, Ambassador Butler guided the U.S. Military Command in transitioning operational lead to the U.S. Embassy from the military. That was his second involvement in Iraq. Previously, he served as President Bush's Deputy Assistant Secretary for Near East in charge of the State Department Iraq policy and operations. Between his Iraq engagements, he was involved with NATO's Afghanistan and Balkan issues. He previously was Deputy High Representative, Principal Deputy High Representative for Bosnia and Herzegovina, U.S. Ambassador in Macedonia, and Director for Europe on the White House National Security Staff, where he was a staff lead for President Clinton during the 1998 Northern Ireland Good Friday Peace Accords. His other assignments include Deputy Chief of Mission in Copenhagen and in Dublin, and Cold War era Section Chief postings in Finland and Bulgaria. He speaks Portuguese, Finnish, Bulgarian, Macedonian, Serbian, Swedish, Danish, and says he can hold his own in Spanish and then cheerfully can insult people in both German and French without understanding what their reply might be. But I'll end with one very, very important thing. Ambassador Butler has received the Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, Joint Chiefs of Staff Distinguished Service, Civilian Service Award, which is quite an achievement. Ambassador, I couldn't get all of it in, but I got what I thought were the highlights, and thank you so much for being with us, sir. Over to you. Hey, Bill, thanks. Nora, Nora Medin, thank you for uh, the, you know, thank you for the opportunity to, to join. And I'm just delighted to see some uh, colleagues of mine 
uh, ranging from Brussels to somewhere in California, sign in, uh, Liz and, and, and Melissa, good to see your names up there. Um, we start out by, uh, by a little self-effacing that uh, when I was in my incoming junior officer foreign service class back in 1976, at the end of it, I was voted the, the person that was most likely to be kicked out of a country first. Uh, <laughs> And uh, which means I'm not very politic, uh, which any, any of my sisters and probably my wife would agree with you. But today is, it's, I'm uh, going to be talking about policy and some of it's going to be uh, controversial and complicated, but not about politics, full stop. Um, I do my best never to come to California, uh, for ex with the exception of going out to Fort Irwin at the National Training Center. Possibly because back when I was working for President Bush uh, in charge of Iraq policy during the surge, um, I apparently offended uh, the Speaker of the House uh, in, in a hearing, and um, she published a, uh, uh, a, a resolution in the Congress condemning me for stonewalling Congress, which is framed on the wall on the opposite side of where I'm sitting right now. So um, I've, I've never been afraid to offend anybody or, 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 or shut up when, 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 when the time was right. So just kind of take that there. Um, second thing is I started my life doing, I was a, an economics officer, so I did trade policy. And I was one of the top persons in the State Department when the European Commission became the European Union. And I can't, can't quite tell you uh, how I managed to go into military affairs, Paul Mill, uh, and conflict resolution. But that's, uh, that's where I ended my career. Actually, about half my career was that. So, uh, And NATO was always one of my first loves, probably because I was an an army brat living in Germany in the 1950s when my dad was an army officer uh, standing uh, between the, the Soviets uh, and the West. Um, so, you know, I'm a transatlanticist first, second, and last uh, when you scratch me. So that's what we're going to go into. So I'm going to share a slide now so you can stop looking at me, um, for which I think a lot of people are going to be grateful. Uh, and just give me a moment while we fire this up. There we go. Hopefully, uh, Bill, is it there? Yes, yes it is. Okay, so the topic is, is 1949, NATO's born, uh, next year, 2021, are we talking the end of an era of the United States and NATO? Uh, I hope not, but there's a possibility it could be. Here's the order of March today is, you see it, you see it there, there's eight, eight topics. I will go through it as fast as I can. I'm happy to take questions on it, but I'll start with a little bit about you know, where NATO started and kind of maybe where NATO lost its way and, and, and struggled to find its relevance, which I think feeds into the current narrative uh, coming out of the White House and other parts here. Uh, next up is, you know, look, I'm an, I'm an army brat. You know, I'm, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm a, a boomer, which, which I, I hope nobody out there says, okay, boomer, uh, we'll go there. But, you know, I, the greatest generation gave us Bretton Woods, gave us the United Nations, they gave us GATT, which is, you know, global trade, Marshall Plan, NATO, you know, the origins of the European Union, we, you know, we conspire, we were godfathers to that one, and the, uh, the OSCE, which was the so-called Helsinki Accords back in, uh, back in 1975. Here's the current environment that NATO is looking at. Um, it, we're threatening to leave. You're going to see more on that in a second. Budgets, COVID, obviously, Russian hybrid warfare. Russia is conducting new generation gray zone warfare as we speak. It's, it's, it's not kinetic, Nobody, you know, well, not many people are being killed or hurt, but they're affecting and, and driving wedges into our, um, into our democracies. Uh, you've got un unrest in Belarus, uh, Brexit, uh, France, and you probably don't know what the E3 is, but that's not an airplane, we'll come back to that in a second. We have the quagmire called Afghanistan, and I'm reminded that tomorrow is the anniversary of 9-11, uh, and we basically, that's what got us to Afghanistan, and, and 18 years later, for heaven's sakes, we're still there. We have some NATO members that are kind of, shall we say, living up to NATO's political word democracy. Uh, there's a new challenge coming in the high north uh, and across uh, from China, 5G, Polar Silk Road, stuff like that. And the last one is... Uh, we've told the Europeans that we're pulling troops out of Germany and bringing some home and, and others are, are going to be going someplace else. Okay, let's start with NATO. Uh, NATO was created to play zone defense. For those of you who do not like sports analogies, think of basketball where you've got five short people going up against uh, five really tall people. If you go one-on-one, -on -one, it isn't going to work out well with you. And the big tall person is called Russia, was the USSR back in the day. The smaller countries, Luxembourg, Iceland, and things like that. 
So it was, we're going to band together and, and it's herd immunity, it's herd protection. Um, so you can see where it is. And then, and then suddenly 12 became 14. Uh, Turkey and Greece worked through their things. Germany finally, you know, was out of, out of quarantine, so to speak, after the war. Spain got rid of uh, uh, Franco. And then I was happy, I was at the White House when we added Poland, Hungary, and Czech Republic in 1999, which was the 50th anniversary. Seven more in four in 2004, three more between 2009 and whatever the next number is. And then this year, my old, my old country, North Macedonia, became the 30th member of NATO. Remaining possibly Bosnia and Serbia, and that's probably the end of it right now. So this is my favorite quote. What was NATO, uh, what was his purpose? And this is a, the, a British general who became the first NATO Secretary General. Russians out, America's in, Germans down. That was a very clear statement of purpose, and it was achieved. Um, but let's think about what happened in 1945. First off, we all sat down, we being the three gentlemen you see there, uh, and basically agreed to divide up Europe. Uh, you see the, the, the Warsaw Pact uh, countries, and you got the 15 Soviet republics. Um, so now, this is a key point I'm going to come back to you on, is Stalin acquiesced in the division of Europe in 1945, despite probably having a military advantage, because he was bought into the old communist ideology that capital, capitalists would turn on each other in peacetime. When the glue of the, the counter-axis alliance fell apart because the Germans were, Nazi Germany was defeated, we would then turn on each other because that's what Marx and Lenin wrote. Uh, that's according to John Lewis Gaddis. It's a great book. I recommend it, Cold War. Our friend uh, Nikolai Chauche, uh, Ceausescu, uh, 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 Khrushchev in 1956 uh, at, at a reception of the Polish embassy announces to ambassadors, we're going to bury you. I, you, know, you can't, it doesn't get better than that. But 1989 comes along and apparently the Soviet Union didn't bury us. It was the other way around. The wall comes down, but mission accomplished. NATO has succeeded. You know, Russia's out, Russians out, Germans down, Americans are still in. But quo vadis, where, where are we going at that point? Now, this is the challenge. Um, why do we still have almost 80,000 troops in, in Europe? And the answer we're going to, I'm going to come back to in a minute is logistics. Uh, Germany has become the geographic logistical center for Europe. You can't really go anywhere. It's kind of like Delta uh, and Atlanta. If you want to go anywhere, you got to go via Atlanta or Delta at some point. But the problem in 1989 was, okay, we, we mission accomplished. What do we do next? Are we going to sunset the organization or are we going to find new missions? Well, we started expanding. We saw the expansion on it. But then um, all these little operations came up, and I split them into two. One is, is actually related and relevant to Europe. You got Bosnia in 95. Uh, you got Kosovo in 99. Macedonia, you know, short-lived uh, uprising there in that period. And then you have ongoing Mediterranean operations, uh, which is basically driven by 2000, by 9-11. By now we get more problematic. What were we thinking in sending and, and having NATO take command of our operation in Afghanistan? And it's still ongoing. Why, is the, why was there an Iraqi training mission for five years as part of the multinational force in Iraq uh, when we invaded in 2003? What was NATO doing out in the Indian Ocean, you know, chasing Somali pirates? And then, and this is a head scratcher for me, uh, 2010, 2011, opera, you know, this was Libya, you know, this is like, we got to protect Benghazi, let's take Gaddafi out, and let's, let's see how that works out. So my argument here is that we basically found NATO useful as a tool for projecting U.S. foreign policy interests, with the exception of Libya, which was more European driven, but we acquiesced in it. Everything else was here was, was on us, whether it was the Bush administration, Later, the Obama administration, uh, it, it became a useful instrument. You can ask the question, is it really relevant to what it should be doing? So in the meantime, while they're out running around, NATO is trying to make itself a more modern organization. So it comes up with my new favorite oxymoron, centers of excellence. And I always say that if you have to say you're a center of excellence, you're probably neither a center nor you excellent. But this is like the, every country's got one. Um, the, one of the better ones is up in Estonia, and it's NATO Center of Excellence on Cybersecurity. And that, and that was developed because the Russians attacked them uh, about 10 years ago, and, the, and, and the, the, the Estonians realized they had no way to defend themselves. But having said that, this is kind of like you know, more talk shop and doing things. And you know, is it really relevant to what we do? 
But the answer is it, it holds the alliance together as it got as it, as it got bigger. Um, but this is the slide I want to show you. And I took this picture, and this is somewhere out in the Helmand Desert. Good heavens, this RC South is the yellow province in the lower lower left hand corner. It's very near Lashkagar, uh, between Lashkagar and Kandahar. Um, you know, I just, I scratched my head about, you know, there's 33 countries running around there and, you know, and we don't have a whole lot to show for it, which is going to make a lot of European and American publics ask, what is NATO doing and why are we spending money on this one? But, you know, there you go. Now, let's go into things that didn't go so well. Um, and these are mistakes. So if the Bush administration decides that, you know, going to Afghanistan and staying and then going to Iraq and staying was a good idea, now we fast forward to the Obama administration. And in the wake of our friends, the Russians, deciding to, to snatch a piece of Georgia called South Ossetia, um, less than six months later, after President Obama is inaugurated, Hillary Clinton goes to Geneva with the uh, misnamed reset button. And that's Sergei Lavrov, who is still the foreign minister of, um, of Russia, uh, who's, who's definitely using his middle finger to press the button while the Secretary of State is laughing uh, at what I'm not 100% sure. I'm sure they thought that Russia, you know, was we were going to be friends and it was all going to be good. Oops, let's fast forward to 2014, Crimea. We know that story is. And then, and then 2011, I was in Iraq. I had four or five generals walk up to me when we started, you know, bombing Iraq and going after Gaddafi. And the question was, didn't we learn anything from Iraq? And we did not have a plan for what was going to happen when Gaddafi was gone. And we're still dealing with the consequences of that because it led to chaos in North Africa and in, in the Sahel, Nigeria. You know, you think of, uh, uh, you know, everything that's going on down there. And then, of course, uh, over in Syria, which we're still, you know, trying to struggle with that. So this is like, this is not, shall we say, there's a lot of accomplishments and sort of accomplishments from NATO here. But then it's, it's, just, it's just like, why? Uh, so that's my thought. But. I'm going to back up to the Clinton administration in 1998, and our friends, the Brits, get lured into a lovely French seaside town of Saint-Malo. You might know it better from World War II in Normandy, uh, paratroopers, and, and Jacques Chirac, who's then the president, talks Tony Blair into signing the declaration, which basically creates the European security and defense identity, which is the foundation for what eventually may become a European army, not a NATO army, but a European army. Up until then, the United Kingdom had been blocking uh, using its, its veto uh, to prevent that from happening, uh, which is now allowing, potentially opens the door for the European Union to emerge as an autonomous security actor. Okay, let's move on from that. Wow, now let's add some gasoline to the fire. So you've already got you know, some issues out there where the Europeans think that you know, NATO is obsolete and they would like you know, not to follow Americans into stupid, never ending wars. That's one view of it. Uh, but then we have a can presidential candidate who this is a quote, it's, it's obsolete and if we have to walk, we, ha we will walk. You know, full stop, that's 2016. Um, now we're gonna get to E3. There's a couple of newspaper stories. I'm, I picked New York Times, so I'm, I'm an East Coast person. Uh, already 18 months ago, 19 months ago, uh, New York Times says, hey, the President of the United States has been discussing pulling NATO out. There's been uh, talk about how the NATO allies aren't spending 2% of their gross domestic product on their military, which is an agreement we have inside NATO uh, and other issues. But clearly this is also a president who doesn't think much of alliances. Uh, based on, on, on the track record. This is more recent. Uh, so this is just a, just a week ago, seven days ago. Uh, and I'm not sure, I did, didn't go through all the sources on it, but you know, right now there's, there's a track record of maybe if, you know, in, the next, in the next Trump administration, there will be, we will actually walk out of NATO. We'll say bye-bye from the Washington Treaty. Um, but there we are. Now we have the French. And one of the reasons why NATO is in Belgium is it started life in Paris until Charles de Gaulle kicked us out. We moved NATO headquarters to Brussels. We moved the Supreme Headquarters Allied Powers Europe to Mons, a economically depressed, makes Appalachia look prosperous uh, section of Belgium closer to the French border. Uh, basically on your way to Paris, you drive by it. Uh, not there. So we set up down there and now we just fast forward to uh, Emmanuel Macron 
who has a couple of meetings with the President of the United States that doesn't go very well. And is on the, on the record quote, we don't have the same definition of terrorism. And this is my favorite picture of, 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 of Macron. Those are Danish soldiers behind him, which is hysterical. Uh, we have a French president reviewing uh, Danish soldiers because the Danes, when they joined the, the, uh, uh, the, Europe, when the European Union uh, uh, elevated its, you know, came up with another treaty, Lisbon Treaty, they had four opt-outs and one was they would not never be part of the European army. So there's, there's some irony in the independent choosing this picture, which is, this is one's political, but I just like it because I served in Denmark. Uh, and I think, I think it's, you know, it, it says war. Now, let's fast forward to February. Uh, now the Europeans are picking up on Europe is thinking about divorcing the United States. Now let's go to a less than a month ago. The defense minister of, of Germany invited her British and French colleagues to a meeting in Saarland uh, for uh, so, a, a something called the European Three uh, to talk about the possibility of a European army. Um, what what is some of the more background behind this one that I want to get into is the bottom picture. Um, I took this picture. That is President Obama at NATO's 60th anniversary summit in Strasbourg. And he is pressing the flesh and shaking. Uh, that's the former uh, uh, Secretary General of NATO next to him. Uh, and it was a very friendly event uh, where he got a lot of, lot of stuff done while he was there. It was impressive to watch. Um, we're going to go to the top one. And that was just uh, two years ago, or last year. Uh, and you can kind of see the body language is just a little bit different. Um, and, you know, I'm a diplomat. We deal with people and relationships. That's, that's our job. I spoke a little bit, uh, I took a little bit uh, about, you know, why, why is Germany important to the alliance and important to us? And you can see this is like a rundown of what we have in Germany right now. What you're not seeing on this is that that airplane that's up in the top three hours from, from Berlin, there's a major port up there called Bremerhaven. If we ever needed to go anywhere inside of Europe, that's the military port we use. And it's got the rail connections to rail to the, uh, the rivers, the river transport system, as well as, and Ramstein Air Force Base is, is our big, big logistics hub that we support both Iraq and Afghanistan on now. And there's a major army hospital launch tool there. So there's a lot of, 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 of infrastructure there that we're about to either walk away from or potentially alienate a, a very important ally. And they're still an ally. Um, so I picked up on that and, and we're gonna hit on this one. Uh, this was an announcement last month that we are pulling out, you know, 12,000 uniform military personnel, uh, 6,000 are coming home. Uh, the, the second uh, cavalry regiment is gonna leave um, uh, uh, Bavaria and come back to someplace in the States and everybody else is going to Italy or going up to Belgium or going someplace else. Um, this, is, you know, this is interesting, but it's a message to Berlin that you know, our relationship, which, which has been extremely successful since 1945, is coming to an inflection point. And by extension, our relationship with NATO even though one of the arguments is that we are going to be moving uh, the U.S. European Command Headquarters, which is currently in Stuttgart, and that, that was my last assignment, we're going to move it to Belgium. I can tell you right now that they took more than 10 years from the time they broke ground before they were able to move into the new NATO headquarters in Brussels, and they're, they're still finishing work uh, there. If we move the U.S. European Command down to Mons, um, it's going to take at least 10 years to create something so it'll be a while before you actually see U.S. European Command move. Presumably, this actually happens. Um, but, you know, there's a lot of excited people out there up in Belgium thinking they're going to get more American money dropped into them. Um, so this is, this is where I'm going to sum up and, and, and talk into some of the, of the things here, which I hope will generate some great questions. Um, are we looking, you know, you know, the joke about Afghanistan, not the joke, the, the, the saying about Afghanistan, it was the graveyard of empires. Well, I wonder right now if the last three years and going forward for the next five years, we might look, be seeing a new tombstone added to the graveyard of international alliances. Everything on the, uh, around that tombstone are agreements that we've walked out of. Uh, which I should probably put the World Health Organization on there. Uh, and there's, there, there, this, this is the big ones for me. Uh, the UNHCRC is the United Nations uh, Human Rights Commission, which, which we left. Um, our, our allies have, you know, are watching us 
walk away and instead of multilateral negotiations and diplomacy, we are now focused on bilateral diplomacy, which as a former trade negotiator is extremely inefficient. Um, you know, we've got 50 years. The reason why California and a lot of other places are as wealthy as we are today is quite frankly is because of the the, the gap, the general agreement on, on trade and tariffs and followed by the World Trade Organizations and what our trade negotiators have succeeded over the years in doing in opening up markets to American goods and services over the years. But here's where we are is, is the Europeans, some Europeans are seeing both an opportunity, that would be the French, as well as the need to have a plan B should the United States leave NATO. And that is the E3, you know, this, this German, French, uh, British, uh, British uh, arrangement, which is made actually more relevant by Brexit now that the UK is no longer or is about to not be part of the United Kingdom, of, of, the, of the European Union. And that will happen at some point uh, in October, you know, no later than October. And I, I, I predict that there will not be an, a, 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 an agreement on it. So it's going to be an ugly break. It's going to be a cold break. Uh, but that's, you know, that's kind of what it looks like right now. Um, and they're trying to figure out, so, you know, if not the United States, you know, who then? And now we're we'll go back to keep Russians out, Americans in, and Germans down. Well, the Americans are leaving. The Russians are all over, all, all over Europe right now. They have assassinated people with, uh, with Novichok, the, the nerve gas. They've actually assassinated people with bullets in Germany. Uh, they've interfered with elections. They did interfere with the Brexit. Um, and, and I would, uh, and then, and then on top of it, you know, so sort of we have a, we have bigger problems such as China. So that's why I wanted to say something. Um, the, you know, the venue shopping that we're looking at right now is one thing, but China is another thing because that does represent a challenge. Not I think we may have lost the ambassador. The ambassador will be joining us via phone. Thank you all for your patience. Luckily, we prepared for this by That's right. testing, testing the phone connection. <laughs> That's right. Remember when we did the rehearsal? Yep. Okay. Be sure to uh, send your to put your uh, send your questions in using the uh, the box at the bottom. Uh, we've already got quite a few questions, probably enough for six or eight hours, actually. But if you've got some more, please put them in. Once we get the ambassador back and he's completed his comments, we'll go to the questions. And uh, Bill, I was thinking when ambassador join us, in case we don't get to all the questions, perhaps you can forward it to ambassador and we can always um, have it on as a distribution on our website. Of course. So, yeah. Of course. Ambassador is joining us now. I see him. There we go. Oh, good. Yeah, the, the, you know, this, this is, I'm gonna blame this one, I'm gonna call it out. This is, you know, you can thank Spectrum for this one. So, uh, you know, the squirrel stopped running in the cage, so I apologize. Actually, Ambassador, we got a question that's asking if Russia interfered. <laughs> <laughs> oh, this is awesome. That's a, that's a great question. Anyway, anyway. 
That's, that's sorry. That's a real question. <laughs> uh, well, it, it, I doubt it. Trust me, uh, where, where I am, uh, our internet is so spotty and tends to go in and out. So uh, I, don't, I, don't, I don't ascribe this to anything other than, than the fact that we don't have broadband in Maine. Let's just go there. All right, can you, can you see me again? Yes, we can. Yes, we can. Okay, where did, uh, uh, Bill, where did you lose me? Uh, keep going forward on your slides. Uh, right here, actually. Well, one more. Uh, the next one. The next one. This one? one? With, one with Putin. Yep, we, we didn't see that. All right, got it. So, um, you, you, you saw me, you, you saw a quote early on in my presentation, uh, or an, an evaluation by John Lewis Gaddis that Stalin, you know, agreed to the division of Europe because he just assumed the ideology would turn the capitalists against each other. Uh, Bob Woodward's book has got this quote uh, from the president, uh, which pretty much illustrates what Stalin thought would happen, uh, but he got it, he was wrong by 71 years. And I'm assuming this quote is, a, you know, is legitimate. Uh, the president actually said it. Uh, I have no idea why anybody thinks a general cares more about trade than, 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 the, than, the, than alliances. Uh, and, and, and here's why. Um, Secretary of State Mike Pompeo has been rightfully very focused on, on the challenges that China presents to us. Gave a speech where he said, you know, securing our freedoms from the Chinese Communist Party is a mission of our time. Therefore, it's time for a new grouping of like-minded nations, a new alliance of democracies to deter China. And he says more about communist China. Um, Thomas Friedman, you know, the columnist in the New York Times, uh, had, had the best response I've heard from it so far, where he said, it's hard to have an alliance without allies. And you know, this picture, the you know, smiling picture at the United Nations of, of Putin and, and, and uh, Lavrov from a couple years ago kind of really, really illustrates this, this challenge of, yeah, NATO maybe isn't, you know, it, it, it doesn't have the same mission. You know, we, we've caused it to do some things uh, that, that probably doesn't make it very popular at home. Uh, it certainly you know, raises questions, but at the same time, we see a clear and present challenge to the unification of, of, of Europe, the, you know, both attacks on the European Union, attacks on NATO, because if there's one thing that Moscow wants more than anything else, is that Europe and the transatlantic alliance be divided, because then he can play one-on-one -on -one basketball with smaller countries the same way we apparently we want, we prefer to go play one-on-one -on -one basketball with smaller countries because, you know, we're, we're a huge country. Uh, and we usually get our way when we go one on one. That, you know, but it goes the other way. Um, so I have a I have a real challenge in in, in accepting and understanding. You know, why is it that we would want to, to jettison a the most successful political military you know alliance in history, which has evolved, uh, which has the potential of providing that platform for the thirty countries that are in it um, to be with us. But you know, my good friend Winston Churchill always has the best line, and I always quote it with anything, eventually we always do the right thing. But the policy challenge, policy challenge for whoever is in the White House a year from today, is if we insist on, on going it alone, we're going to find that a very hard road to hoe. And with that, let's see what 21 brings. So are you ready, ready for questions now? I'm ready to be challenged. Okay. All right. Well, we have a few. Um, so uh, I, there have been several that, that have come in relative to where we put our, where NATO puts its forces. But the one that probably sum up, sums things up the better is what forces are really needed in Poland and other nearby allied countries to effectively deter Russia? So I'm gonna, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna cut that into two pieces. Um, one is, is when, when you have boots, American boots on the ground, it is a tangible commitment of the United States to the defense of another country. Should Poland, Lithuania, Latvia, or Estonia, any of the Baltics uh, be conventionally attacked, um, they're gonna have to go mm -hmm. through 
they're going to have to go through our guys and girls. Uh, how many? That's a great question. I don't think you need a lot. Uh, I, I know that I, we are talking about putting a, I mean, what I read from that thing that I showed you earlier, they're talking about putting a ro rotational brigade of American soldiers that would come and go, that would be, that wouldn't be permanently stationed in Poland. Uh, and then there's, uh, we, we in the NATO has something called en the Enhanced Forward Presence, EFP, where we rotate companies of soldiers, uh, and, and we share this among the Brits, the Dutch, and some others, into the three Baltic countries. And, and this is the three things that NATO has done really well over the years. One is assurance. You know, you guys don't need to spend a lot of money in your military because you're part of a bigger team. We'd like you to focus on making your societies prosperous and safe. Uh, second, we will deter adversaries from attacking. And then when there is a threat out there, we will reassure our allies uh, that we're going to stand there with them. And that's what having, having forces on the ground, you know, do we need like three or four divisions? I hope not. Uh, personally, I don't think the Russians are, are planning a conventional attack anytime soon, but having American forces on the ground, even, even in the quantities I'm talking about, is a deterrence and a reassurance. There's two things that can happen. I'd rather have these countries not spend a big chunk of their budget building the next major line that, is gonna, that, that, uh, that, that um, uh, didn't work out too well in 1939, as we remember. Well, why not move what's in Germany next door to Poland, which is closer to the problem? Um, doing that, well, one, we don't have a lot of, you know, you saw the numbers in Germany. Uh, you know, the, we are bringing the 2nd Cavalry Regiment home, and they're the guys that about three, four years ago did the Jeroen ride where they drove their striker uh, armored vehicles uh, around uh, Poland and Hungary and up, at the, up, uh, and up into the Baltics, you know, basically flew the flag. It, you know, it was a presence. Uh, you know, it, it was, and again, it was reassuring. I'm not sure what the deterrent value was, uh, but it was reassuring the people up there, like, just keep focused on building your economies. Um, Aside from that one, there's a, a battalion of uh, the 10th Special Forces Group that's in Germany, uh, and then you have the Air Force, uh, and then you have a lot of logistical uh, hub there. So redeploying somebody from Germany up into Poland, you know, there's not much to redeploy. So we're actually maybe talking about actually having to bring over a, a unit which is already based in the United States for a six or a nine month rotation in Germany. Think of what we do right now in, in Afghanistan or Iraq. Um, but having said that, they're, they're, they're going to have to live and, and work and play in, in places, which means we're going to be spending money uh, to have their presence there. So, you know, a rotating presence is good. Uh, but having said that, again, I, I'm having a hard time thinking that, you know, the Russians are going to lie awake at night looking at it, you know, an American armor brigade. And this is just a personal opinion. Uh, but it, again, it's boots in the ground. It's a tangible commitment and, and, a, and a tangible statement. Walking away from what we already have in Germany, which is mostly logistical support, uh, just doesn't make economic sense. Okay. Uh, I'm going to switch now and say, and get this question is, should Turkey still be a member of NATO? That is probably the 500,000 lira question. Um, <laughs> That's only a few dollars, but okay. <laughs> yeah, I mean a lot, uh, which is all I can afford right now. Uh, I listed Turkey as, as one of the, you know, a handful of countries that are going in what, I, what you know, a political scientist would say is an illiberal uh, tendency. Um, we've seen the resurrection of tension between two NATO allies, both Turkey and Greece, uh, in the eastern Aegean, and it's over hydrocarbons and drilling and, and all kinds of other things like that. Um, yeah. If, if Turkey wanted to leave, Turkey leaves. Uh, and if Turkey does some of the things that they say they're going to do, you know, for instance, purchase uh, was the S-400 uh, integrated um, uh, air defense system, uh, which, is, which is probably completely connected to you know, whatever Moscow has, because it's all electronics. Uh, but you know, if, if they bought that, you know, and you, I, I'm just repeating what you've already seen in, in the press, that plugs into the NATO early warning system, which means it is now compromised. So that's a challenge. But having said that, you know, Turkey is, is an important ally. It's the southeastern flank of NATO. You know, they sit on the, on the, uh, the, the Dardanelles and uh, Straits, you know, so it's the access in and out of the Black Sea. Uh, and if Turkey is stable, you know, that, you know, that's a stable part of the world. So for me, um, you know, I would like to see President Erdogan be a little less undemocratic in, in what he's doing. I'd like to see him be a little more positive in, in terms of not, you know, not trying to be the local hegemon in the area. But yeah, I think the answer is, is Turkey still meets the 
requirements to be a member of NATO and you know, hasn't done anything to, uh, to warrant it being expelled. I'm not sure there's a mechanism for that one. Question is, does, does Turkey still want to be part of NATO? I don't know. What changes with that? I know you want to deal with policy, but not politics. But the questions, a couple of questions that come up is, what, what change in policy towards NATO would you think might happen with a change of administration? Um, well, since I, I've worked with many of the people who would likely occupy senior national security and foreign policy positions, um, and that's from my time when I was in, in the Clinton White House. So they were, they were relative young, but they were committed to the transatlantic relationship uh, in, all, in all its dimensions, you know, a, a robust relationship with the European Union uh, and a strengthened and, and, and large relationship with, with NATO. So I, I'd expect you would see more emphasis on alliances. Uh, our friend Napoleon had said, said once that the only thing worse than going to war uh, with an alliance is going to war without an alliance. So, you know, the focus on, on multilateral diplomacy and finding, you know, shared shared solutions is what I would expect. Uh, but again, having said that, we might see exactly the same thing uh, should the current administration be reelected. Um, uh, you know, th there's, there's a lot of smart people out there who know it's in our interest to see a prosperous, you know, rel you know re can pull its own weight Europe and a NATO that deters folks from doing things we don't want them to do. Uh, one question that's come up is, could Europe actually be a deterrent to Russia without U.S. troops and without the U.S.? Yeah. Um, one of the things I wanted to say is the biggest deterrent we have, I've got a note on here somewhere, which I already, here we go. So Germany has a pathetic, puny, Army. I was there when Germany was downsizing its military. I mean, they're, they're good soldiers, but there are not very many of them. The Brits, if you put every British soldier into Wembley Stadium, which is a, a, a soccer stadium in England, they won't fill it. There'll be empty seats. What's, what's the seating capacity? 80,000. Uh, France, France is probably the most all around capable, in addition to having a nuclear, uh, nuclear uh, deterrent, uh, uh, European power right now. Um, you know, onesies and twosies, no, there, you know, there's no threat. But, but while Germany would be useless, you know, their army is pretty much useless in a shooting war against Russia, and that's today. That boy, that's a big change from 1989. Uh, they really bought into the peace dividend. You, know, you, you and I are both old enough to remember, yeah, you know, we can, it's the equivalent of defund the police. We'll just defund the military. You know, it didn't turn out quite like that. But Germany has a manu is a manufacturing technology and logistical superpower that would be decisive, one, if there was a, an actual conventional conflict with Russia, but also more importantly, in an economic competition or confrontation with, with China. Mm. Okay, um, I found it interesting that de Gaulle kicked, us, kicked NATO out of Paris. I didn't realize that, that's very interesting. Um, I was in, living in Prague the night that the Czech Republic became a member of NATO. And I was actually in Wenceslas Square and it was incredible to hear the screaming and yelling uh, of how excited the Czechs were to be part of NATO. And do those smaller countries contribute much to NATO so, that used to be part of communism? Um, that's yeah. not a negative comment. I just wondered. Everyone. The answer is yes, because one of the focuses or foci that, uh, that, that NATO did, and we encouraged it strongly, was for the smaller countries um, to develop niche capabilities to contribute to the bigger picture. Now, whether one of the things that Hungary, for instance, uh, is the host for um, a C-17 wing of transports, uh, which a smaller, so think of a, a net jets, where you need to move people or things, uh, you know, there's a fleet of, of C-17s that, that is parked on an old Warsaw Pact era air base in, in Western, Western Hungary. Uh, the Czech uh, Special Forces, um, very effective. Uh, they've, they've done, they've actually done very uh, good things in, in, in the parts of Afghanistan that they've been in. Um, 
likewise, the, the, the Baltics, all three Baltics, uh, you know, the, the Estonians, you know, are contributing, you know, cyber and especially counter disinf you know, disinformation expertise. So the answer is, yeah, they've all like, you know, listen, guys, we don't want you to have tanks, you know, and, and go out and buy, you know, sort of uh, supersonic fighters or, or battleships, but there's things you can do that's appropriate for your size uh, that contribute to the larger picture when we assemble all the pieces together. Here's a very unusual one. Uh, I would have never thought of this, but considering that Turkey is not right in Europe, should Israel be a member of NATO? You know, <laughs> <laughs> That's quite a question. No, no, this actually came up yesterday. I, just by the way, uh, the, the most dangerous place to be, to be uh, at this time of day is to be between a diplomat and the bar. So uh, we're, we're getting up on happy hour here. So uh, I'll take that. <laughs> um, uh, or, the other, or the other place, most dangerous place to be was b to be between Dick Holbrook and a camera. Uh, you, know, you didn't mention the time I spent in, in, in Belgrade. Uh, but Turkey won, you know, a big chunk of Turkey, not all of Turkey is actually in Europe. Uh, but, you know, the largest part of, of, of Turkey obviously is, is on the Asian continent. Uh, but yesterday, you know, over happy hour, somebody's talked about, well, you know, Israel is not a European country. And it says, well, oddly enough, for all intents and purposes, it is. Uh, and U.S. European Command includes Israel as one of the countries that, that, you're, that, that we, we cover. And, of course, Israel is part of the European Song Contest, which I hope everybody had a chance to see the Will Ferrell uh, yeah, Euro song. Uh, you know, probably the best, best movie that came out this summer with apologies to move on. Are there nuclear weapons in NATO in Europe? No comment. Okay. Oh. <laughs> That's, and, and along those lines, a question is, what is your opinion of the Iran nuclear agreement? I, uh, so Tom Pickering, uh, who is a, uh, uh, a, you know, uh, who's the, one of the senior statesmen of the United States, you know, of his era, uh, who's still, still alive, still kicking, is still very, very effective and very relevant. He was a huge proponent of the uh, of of this uh, agreement with with um, uh, with Iran. I am very ambivalent about doing deals with Tehran, uh, but during my time in Europe, towards the end of my career, I realized that there were some countries in the region who really, really wanted the United States to go conduct conventional attacks on, 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 on Tehran to eliminate the, uh, the nuclear threat. And the last thing we need is another, to, to be involved in a land war anywhere on the, on the Asian continent, you know, full stop. Uh, I'm also one of these persons that think that, you know, every Iranian I, literally I've ever met, you know, sounds more like an American than the average American. We have a, a lot more in common than what divides us, but, you know, politics is what it is, or ideology, or maybe religion in this case, uh, you know, what goes on. So, so um, the Iran deal was, it wasn't ideal, but it was the best we could get. Maybe my biggest problem I'm an economist by, by education, is we, we gave them a lot of money, uh, which they're, they have probably tried to use to maybe, you know, behind the scenes, underground, you know, continue their nuclear program. Um, but for the period that the, the agreement was in effect and we were, we were observing it or, or part of it, I know this, the snapback right now is, you know, is in, in discussion up the United Nations about whether you know, since we left it, you know, can we actually call for a snapback? You know, and every year, every UN country will then put sanctions back on on Iran. That's not going to happen. Uh, so we 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 there's no there's no I've yet to bet, find anybody who's invented a time machine so you can go back in time. Uh, and I don't like to think about well, what if the South had won the Civil War or the Nazis had gotten the nuclear weapon first? You know, that's all hypothetical, and you can write novels about it. Uh, it, it is, it is what, it, what it was. Uh, it did contribute to some stability. Um, but the bigger problem we had with, with the Iranians was uh, we were allowing them and their proxies to commit mayhem in various places of the world. Uh, and, you know, sort of that, that containing Iran, allowing events to take their course is how I would have preferred to do it. Um, the Israelis would rather take action uh, because they're a lot closer to the problem. Uh, but other than that one, this is one where, hey, it, 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 it was what it was. We are where we are. I'm not sure what happens next because I'm not sure you can put Humpty Dumpty back together again. 
And as we're getting close to our time, uh, a question came up about Belarus. Uh, is that a challenge to NATO? And do you think Russia is going to try to take them over as a satellite? So here we go. Belarus is in the, you know, on the margins, it's in NATO's sphere of influence. If I can go back to Yalta, uh, 1945 reference. Um, do we have a dog in that fight? The answer is, is, did we have a dog in the fight in Libya? Um, we went into Libya and I'm going, I'm doing apples and oranges right now. We, we used a, a, a concept referred to as responsibility to protect R2P as the rationale for getting a UN resolution, which allowed us to do what we did in Libya. And we're reading the results right now. Um, this is a case where you might, we're seeing opposition leaders either being expelled from the country or being detained. You know, this is reminds me a little bit of what, what you know, we just go back to the Czechoslovakia, the, the Prague Spring, 1968. Um, are we prepared to go to war? Are we prepared to get an armed conflict over uh, Lukashenko, you know, the last dictator of Europe, uh, you, know, you know, stealing an election? And the answer is, you know, so what is the American national interest? Uh, we'd like to see Belarus, evolve into a democratic, liberal, law-abiding country uh, where its citizens are, you know, enjoy human rights, like most, most of Europe enjoys today. Um, but, you know, I, I, I'm one where you watch it carefully. Uh, we do what we can to support the democratic, you know, processes there. But, you know, be careful about the, the interference because you don't, when you break it, what was the Colin, Colin Powell's Pottery Barn uh, rule? If you break it, you own it. And, you know, we have a track record one of my lines is, we have no business picking other people's leaders. Look at what we do to ourselves. <laughs> but it's on us. It's our responsibility to choose our leaders, not our responsibility. You know, we pick somebody else in another country. Uh, uh, you know, we don't have the, you know, we don't bear the responsibility of the consequences of it. So that's kind of my parting thought on that one is watch it carefully. I want to thank you so much for your time and insight. It was really awesome. Do you have any uh, final comments you'd like to make? Well, I'm watching Gil Jacobs staring at me. Yay, Gil. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> so I've seen way too many, not way too many. I'm not seeing not enough of, of old friends and, and colleagues. Uh, we've been really fortunate. Uh, you've had people like Gil Jacobs, Melissa McCurry and uh, Liz Bonkowski. I think Fred was on here as well, you know, who have spent their time in places that nobody else really wants to go to. Uh, you know, representing our country and the more diverse and geographically, ethnically, everything else we have is good. So I want to thank you for what you do and give me a chance to, uh, you know, spout off a little bit uh, for the folks in Orange County. Well, uh, before I turn it back over to my leader, Nora, I want to thank you for your service. No, thank you. Thank you very much, um, Ambassador. Uh, indeed, enlightening, and I always learn a lot from our diplomats. Um, I feel that our purpose of being an educational organization is fulfilled when your experiences and your knowledge can give us an insight um, into matters that sometimes we don't get it in a straight way from a politician because diplomats are nonpartisan. And as we are as a, yes, <laughs> yes, you are at least for one hour. <laughs> um, and as we are also, hopefully we can jointly learn. I also wish to thank all of our participants and for the wonderful questions that came in. If there are any additional questions, Ambassador, we will um, email them to you. And when you have time and you get around it, uh, you can respond to us and then we will um, distribute uh, the uh, answers. We really feel that our public and our members and also our guests learn so much from you folks. So that I'm immensely grateful for that. If this was an in-person event, you would be at the hotel right now in Southern California and I would be buying you that drink which would be what, like a glass of red wine or martini? I can't see too well. <laughs> oh, okay, okay. Okay, okay. <laughs> <laughs> and also you would be getting um, a crystal plaque from us, uh, which would be a symbol of um, our council. But since you're not in Southern California, we will we'll send you distance hugs and thank you for your wonderful 
um, knowledge and, and what you've shared with us. Um, I am originally from Iran and I thank you and your perspective of not going into war with another country. It, um, it just, I hate to see any of the young people getting killed in that part of the world for not necessarily a good reason always. So thank you for that. Um, our next event will be next uh, week on the 16th and the topic will be on China. So another very interesting webinar coming up. Please check our website and learn. And also if you be kind and give us your feedback on the webinar today, the program and the videos will be subsequently available and accessible and will be broadcasted to all of you. Uh, Ambassador, it's been an honor hosting you. Um, as a little girl growing up in Iran and coming to America as, a, um, as an immigrant, I would have never imagined that someday I would be talking to an American ambassador. And just through all the Fair Council, it's been an honor that I've met over 30 ambassadors and diplomats. So I'm truly honored. Thank you for sharing your time with us. Bill, thank you for the wonderful moderation. Appreciate that. I'd like to thank all of our uh, in terms, without them, we're not able to do our job and thank Medina, our executive director, for her leadership. Be safe, everyone, and we'll Be see safe. you next week. Thank, thank you. Thank you, Ambassador. Thank hey, you. Thanks, Bill. Right. Appreciate your time. Uh, it was great. Gil, you still on there somewhere? Can, can, you, can somebody unmute him so I can actually annoy him? Uh, uh, can you hear me now? Yeah, I can hear you now. <laughs> How are you doing? Yeah, good. It's good to see your friend. How's, how's the family? Well, we're good. I'm retired like uh, almost 10 years. We live in Charleston, South Carolina. It's lovely. God bless you. I'm going to be down in, uh, I'm going to be at Sumter um, in about two weeks. Okay. We're, uh, and it's, uh, no, everything's doing fine. You know, I was doing some consulting work, but, uh, and I keep in touch with some people from the embassy. So, and I, and I follow your career. Oh boy. <laughs> uh oh, <laughs> can't get away. I see Richard is online. Richard, are you there, Downey? Yes. Uh, Hi. There he is. Oh, you un unmute yourself. Oh, thanks so much for doing this, Ambassador Butler. We it was really excellent. Uh, and, and again, greetings from Fort Irwin and the National Training Center. We, you are missed. <laughs> How, how hot is it out there? Not too bad. Today, not bad. Today is about 75. The oh, other so day at around 112, it was uh, a little rough. It was a little rough. Yeah. That's, that's a racky rough. Yes. <laughs> Very cool. Well, right. thank you, Richard. I think Bill did a great job of stepping into your shoes, but we'll miss you today, sir. All right. Bill, thank you. Thank Take you. Take care, Larry. Bill. Thanks a bunch. Sorry, appreciate yeah. it. Thank you very much. Dropping out. Have a good Thank one. Thank you. Bye-bye.